What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current Fishing. Um, excited to bring this one to you tonight. We got a podcast. We're going to talk about kind of. We've got a lot of things we kind of want to hit, but our main focus is going to be that fall mullet run that we see happen. Uh, you know, from Virginia. Maybe I don't even know. If, I'm not sure if the mullet run is much further than Virginia, um, but at least from Virginia all the way back down into Florida. So, massive schools of mullet wadding up, moving down the beach, moving down the waterways. Uh, with a lot of fish targeting them as, as a as a food source, you know, as they're making their way back down. So, we'll talk about that. We've got some other updates to bring to y'all. Um, we got hunting season right around the corner. Uh, if you are interested in booking any type of hunting trip or fall speckled trout or fall albacore trip, just reach out to us. We got some openings still, and this is just a great time of year to get outside. Um, also, go check out the Facebook group. Check out our Patreon page. We got some extra content over there that we're going to be really beefing up this fall as we get a little bit more time. And uh, looking forward to doing some more videos. We got a fishing video that's finished being edited, that I just finished editing that's going to go out probably this coming week. And we have a hunting video in the pipes, a goose hunting video, so that'll be up there soon as well on YouTube. Um, so if you're just listening to the podcast platform, definitely check out the YouTube. Come subscribe on the channel. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, press that like button. It definitely just helps get this out there. Um, if you're if you're listening every time, just hit that like button. It definitely it is super easy. It's right there underneath the screen, and it helps us out a lot. So. Um, I do appreciate that. And if you've never left a review over on uh, iTunes or any of the podcast platform, Spotify, definitely do that because that helps us as well. And it's uh, we're, we're very thankful for that. But I'm going to go ahead and bring on my boys, Michael and Cameron. What's up, guys? How are you tonight? Oh, doing good. Doing good. You are looking good. We were just spending about five minutes beforehand trying to get all our, <laughs> our head sizes the same and like kind of lined up. But Michael, your head's definitely still bigger. But the thing is, is yours is like bigger because your camera's closer. Mine just looks bigger because I think I'm, I just have a fat head. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little jealous. What setting is your hat on? Is it on the last notch? It's not on the last notch. I am f- four notches from the last one. So I guess it's not too big. Right. But yeah, that's not bad. Not too bad. Um, speaking of heads, though, you were t- uh, bragging about your mullet earlier, Cameron. Oh, yeah. Thinking about you know, shaving the sides and kind of letting the back of it just kind of drip down a little bit, you know? I think you should. I uh, I hunted with a guy the other day that had a very legit mullet, and then he had the sides <laughs> shaved down, and it, it looked awesome. I was like, man, I, w- I would totally rock that. Um, <laughs> and then he had his, his brand, he had like a, a clothing brand, like a, like a hunting clothing brand, little small company, and he had it, the name of it in the side, like in the shavings right there. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, it was impressive. it was impressive for sure. I don't know if yeah, I, I personally could go that impressive. far, but I th- I would rock a mullet. I think I would. I would rock any type of hairstyle if it just meant that I got to have hair. So <laughs> <laughs> y- I, y'all I could choose. Those days, John. <laughs> I used to have some away. hair. I used to have some hair. Yeah. God, they feel so far away though. Feels so Sorry, far away. Got, got now all I've got is beard. I've got beard dandruff uh, drafting on my phone right here below my chin. <laughs> when I move that. Um, well, sweet. Well, how have y'all? How have y'all been? We haven't all three been on the podcast in a little while. I've been good. I've been um, staying busy with the little one, as I'm sure Mike can uh, can <laughs> kind of agree with me there. Oh yeah, I would say same here. Busy fishing, just doing all the prep work for coming into hunting season um, for deer hunting, especially. So, I know Judd helped me with some of that a few weeks ago. So, but getting boats ready, everything for fall time fishing, kind of switching gears like Judd was talking about with the mullet run. So, man, you've had a a headache of problems, like just little crap breaking on your boat recently, <laughs> haven't you? Yeah, and let's say starting battery, trolling motor battery issue with battery, battery charger starting. Battery charger, trolling motor remote went out. Yeah, like everything in about the last three weeks. Yeah, so. like freaking <laughs> a couple grand worth of issues in a, in a couple weeks. It always sucks. That's how it happens with boats, man. It's just like one yeah. thing. Out. You'll get a good if you if you've been on a good long stretch of like nothing wrong with your boat. You're like, man, I really love this boat. I'm glad I got this one. This has been a good boat. <laughs> That's yeah. usually when it's about to start, you know, screwing up on yeah. you. But um, I feel like when your boat hits five years old. It just, things just start breaking out of nowhere. Yeah, five years. Like, pretty consistently. 
I think we should was... coin boat years. You know how there's like dog years? Like a boat is, it, yeah, it's five years old, but it's really 140 years old in <laughs> <Yeah>. boat years. <laughs> yeah, every year for a boat is about 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so I true. mean, mine all started with just little flickers of like my radio going out here and there. And then like. Yeah, so you got an overall like little wiring work. thing. Yeah, and like my whole fuse block was just toast. Like I would lose my trim tabs or something random. So I got that fixed and then it was like immediately my starting battery went out the next weekend. Hmm. And then the next week was one of my trolling motor batteries was perfect. The other one shot. And mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that had to do with my battery charger, but yeah. It was it, just like one thing after another. It's funny how it is like that though. You know, one thing and then you'll fix it all and you'll it's but it's almost nice. It's better than always having yeah. one thing broken. I don't know. I don't know. I'd just rather everything always work, but um, you know, it's just tough in the saltwater world. Like my brother's bass fishes all the time, bass boat. I mean, and bass boats got so much more going on on it. And granted, he doesn't fish and run the boat as much as I do. But man, that boat never has any issues. It's, everything's just always kind of working fine. I really think salt is just such a key factor of why stuff mm-hmm. starts to screw up. But um, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. And trailers, <laughs> trailers are another big. Oh my god! Golly. <laughs> I feel like no matter how much I spray my trailer off with fresh water after just dunking it, you know, dunking it and taking it out, there's going to be salt corrosion somewhere on that trailer at some point. Oh, um, for sure. But I think this is all like a good reminder that anything you can spray down with fresh water, whether that be like, but luckily, like I can access my ga- my uh, gas tank, battery charger. All that stuff, like, if you can wash it down, do it, because it'll increase the longevity of all that equipment. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mike, what is a... Uh, so Mike used to work for a company in Wilmington that I wish was still around called Trailer Medic. It was you and your buddy, Grant. <laughs> um, but since we're talking about trailers and boats and trailers messing up, what are some tips for people that have trailers and have boats, but specifically for their trailer, to maybe... Um, prolong the life of the trailer and the components of the trailer? Um, Well, definitely washing it down as much as possible um, is the biggest thing. It it sucks because you go to the boat ramp, you dump your boat in at 7, let's say in the morning, you know, you go fish all day and that salt water just sits there and bakes on it. Um, So we always recommend use either kind of salt away or corrosion away as an additive that you can put on the end of your... um, spray nozzle or on your hose use that once every couple of months knock everything off um if you have leaf springs there's a product called fluid foam a lot of people up north use it to help with um the salt rusting away underneath on the frame of their vehicles i would suggest putting that on anything that's metal on your trailer um especially if you've got leaf springs that's the biggest one that we always saw you know people breaking either a leaf spring or a u-bolt or whatever in there spring hanger um and then lastly if you got the option get a floor jack and i mean for me i do it probably every three to six months just because i can do it quickly i've done it so many times but every three to six months take the cap off of your uh, hubs if you've got the little rubber seal and a zerk fitting pump new grease in it once you jack up the tire you know no one has been uh oh, do we lose him, Cameron? I think so. Yeah, he cut out on my end. Um, I think it was just saying once you uh, get the tire jacked up, but we lost oh, you there, there for a second, back. Mike. You're back. Well, oh. uh, you were saying jack it up, shoot some grease oh. up in the hub. Yeah, and then just put your little seal back on there. Um, if you have ones that just have the metal caps, they're fifty cents or a dollar a piece. It's worth it just to not have to worry about it and have that peace of mind. Um, and whenever you spin your tire, as long as you don't hear any noise from coming from the hub, you're in good shape. Yeah, I've uh, thought I was fine before and jacked my trailer up and spun it, and it was like, <laughs> which you just can't hear when you're driving. I was like, oh, that is the hub I need to change out. <laughs> Bearing was completely shot in it. So, and if that's something that our viewers and listeners are interested in, let us know. Because I, I mean, I do maintenance pretty regularly, so. If y'all got questions or want to see, you know, a hub done or whatever, 
let us know and we, we can make a video on that. Yeah, that would be some a good, tips that'd be a really good thing to do. So, that wouldn't video. be a bad idea at all. Uh, I just um, noticed how it's just right at the very top of the way that this your screen is cut here, Mike. It just has this heart with love up there above oh. your head, just kind of floating above your head. It looks really good. I like it. I like it. I've got a dead animal um, one. Mike's got love. While we're on the topic of um, boat maintenance, I saw and I'm a sucker for Instagram ads. And Do you I buy a lot of those ad. stuff from those? What did you say? Do you buy a lot of stuff from Instagram ads? I mean, a lot being maybe. This Have you might bought be more than second. ten items? No, no, no. This is yeah. probably my second purchase. Okay. From Instagram ads. <laughs> And I, it, it all, all has to do with this one person I follow. I can't remember his name, but he literally, like, every day uses his boat. And he has the same boat as me, and he's always using this product after he's done using it. And I'm like, dude, what is that thing? I can't tell what it is. And I finally figured out what it is. Um, but it's a product called <laughs> – and to, to be clear, I haven't used it yet. So I'll, I'll have to give a review after it comes in, but it's called Salty Captain. And nice. it's essentially like this um, contraption that you screw on to the end of your uh, <coughs> guard hose. And it has like a, like a little filter on the bottom that you put the fluid in and you spray it on your boat and then you just wash all that fluid off. And it supposedly takes like all the salt, all the grime. You don't need to brush it or anything like that. And I'm like, wow. holy crap, this could save me so much time. Was it but pretty now, pricey or was it not too bad? Um, well, uh, to, to be determined again, I didn't look up the price of the fluid for refills, okay. but the, <laughs> the first purchase comes with the nozzle and the contraption on the bottom, as well as like some of the fluid and, and it wasn't like crazy expensive. So gotcha. Gotcha, it, gotcha. it might end up being too expensive to keep doing, but it might be worth something doing once a week or something. Yeah. Just, so, you know, if, if it means taking back you know, 30 to 45 minutes of the day, it might be worth it. Yeah. If anyone's got any good hacks, cause there's always like somebody that's like, Oh man, I've got the perfect soap or chemical that I use for this. Or like, I remember when I found out about, um, or pine wash and wax, like the, that soap I like a lot, but any type of component, like a spray on like that, leave it in the comments. Cause that's something we're definitely always talking about. and would be good to share with others. If you've got any good little boat cleaning hacks to so let us know. Um, but yeah, so the magic eraser is my best friend on my boat. Oh gosh, yeah, the magic <laughs> yeah, eraser is bomb. Awesome. Y'all both have like, well, Cameron, your inside's blue. Judd's got gray yeah. and like cream color, and mine's bright white. And it's so sad at the end of the day to see how dirty it really Dude, is. The uh, mine is mine has gone from like kind of Carolina blue to like really light blue, <laughs> so it's almost white now. Um, oh. But yeah, I mean, if someone wears black shoes. Or something on the bed. Yep. I mean, it's it's everywhere. Yep. Little scuffs everywhere. Yeah, and like um, the the magic eraser works really well. Um, and there's a few other things that work pretty well. Like I've had to use Goo Gone a few times <laughs> to get like some really. Uh, I feel like uh, someone brought their own uh, reel one time, and I think they just oiled it. And the oil had sprayed like all over the deck of the boat, and it would not come off with anything other than goo gone. Oh gosh, man, that stinks. Um, but, yeah, there's uh there's some good little some good little products out there that that work. This is totally turned into like a how to care for your boat episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, Self care and boat care are the same. Um, <laughs> well, sweet. How was y'all's uh, y'all y'all's fishing been lately? been a little all over the place started last week with really good consistent dock fishing and that kind of dropped off and as the weather changed and improved and started really picking up in the creeks there towards the end of the week so finally found a good school of fish um i think on friday um so i think it's gonna start turning around now that weather's starting to you know turn and be a little more consistent after that last little cold drop or cold temperature drop come through Heck yeah. So yeah, it's it's definitely been. I don't know. I would. I, I've been in such a. We had all that rain and the weather changed, and yeah. it's been a little tougher in shore. Um, near shore has been good. There's been a lot of Spanish and albacore out there, but man, I'm ready for the trout to show up. I really am. Like, I, it's it's yeah. such a fun time of year when you can go like 
throw top water for redfish in the morning, then slide out off the beach and then catch some albacore on the falling and then turn around and come in, you know, and, and redfish the slack tide for a minute and then fish the whole incoming for trout. And it's like, you did so many different things. You just have so much potential for, um, fish catching this time of year, but it's, uh, yeah. it's been good. Have you, have y'all, have you done much albie fishing, Cameron? Um, I've done a, a handful, uh, probably four days so far. And I feel like the early season stuff is always pretty similar. Like you'll get a report of, Oh man, the Albies are here like crazy. And you go out there the next day and you see like, you know, a couple pots of them. Yeah. Um, but it, it definitely varies like year to year, I feel like. And sometimes you can get it really good, like right when they show up, um, but it can also turn on and off like a light switch. I uh, wouldn't say it's like super consistent right now by any means. Um, you may have gotten it uh, really good like right when they first showed up. But I feel like as soon as it warms up or if we get a bunch of rain, it's like they disappear for a few days. Um, tough, yeah. So I'd say it's still fairly inconsistent right now, but you can definitely go out there and catch them. Um, as long as you're patient enough and you cover a lot of ground, uh, and sometimes it's super tide dependent. My, I feel like my best Albi days have always been on um, an outgoing tide, just because a lot of those glass minnows and mullet schools and anchovies have all gotten pushed inshore on the incoming tide, and then once that tide starts dripping out, they all start peeling out and I sometimes feel like those false albacore kind of stage up in those inlet areas to wait and ambush those schools as they come out. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree for sure. It's uh, just like a big funnel, big buffet for them, just shoving people yeah, out Yeah, pretty out much, there. yeah. You know, I that, feel like in, when, the, when the tide's like dead low, it's like all those schools have gone, all those schools of bait, to clarify, have like gone out in the ocean and they can be like, that's when they can be a little bit hard to find because they're like, they've broken up a lot of those bait schools and you'll see like two pop over there and then three pop over there and you're just like running around like a mad person. Right. They're not all wadded up on a on a single section of bait. There's a ton of mullet in the ocean right now too and a ton of menhaden as well as the bay anchovies and the silver sides. And there's okay. been... Do what? I found two good groups of uh, jumping <laughs> herring the other day. Oh really? Nice. Yeah, is that what you called the king surprised. off of? Uh, I don't know what I called the king off of. I thought it was pogies, but the next day we went out and I was a little north of there, uh, of that where I caught the king, and um, got on two big wads of threadfin. So, nice. it's crazy those threadfin will eat a jig. You like a lot of times I'll be Spanish fishing, oh, like yeah. I'll throw in a busting Spanish, and you get a bite and you reel it in, and it's a threadfin that ate the jig. I remember the first time that happened, I was like. What the heck? I snagged this fish in the mouth. But they actually will eat those little. They're in there eating the the same thing the Spanish are eating. So, really? um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Um, but it's like sometimes they're they're busting baits like that, and then other times they're schooled up like menhaden. It's kind of weird. Um, hmm. but yeah, there's just so like up against the jetties and whatnot, just mullet just jammed up in there. I mean, so thick. I was watching Albies blow mullet up the other day. Watching Spanish cut through them. It is a great time of year to slow troll a big mullet or slow troll them in Hayden just because there's so much bait stacked up. Um, and, and I used to be like, that sounds so boring, like slow trolling a live bait. It is super fun. <laughs> it is a really fun yeah. way to fish, especially you know if you can get around fish blowing up and whatnot. It can be very, very effective. Um, Jed, would you say, because um, I'm not like by any means an expert in Spanish fishing, but would you say the most productive times for Spanish are early summer and early fall? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, and, and there's like little windows of productiveness throughout the summer too, but um, it's especially big Spanish, like this time of year through the fall a little yeah. bit and then like early spring, like early, early spring, like before mm -hmm. you're really even thinking about fish, most people are thinking about fishing the ocean. That's when those big Spanish are around. Um, yeah, this time they kind I of show like up to some certain areas. <laughs> Excuse me. Just like from seeing pictures and reports that I've heard, is like, um, you know, Spanish fishing is always really good early summer. 
uh, you just see people catching. That's like when you see the coolers like just chock full of Spanish mackerel, and then like middle of summer, it just gets kind of dead. Like you can catch them, but you have to be there like in the right spot at the right time. Yeah. And then this time of year, you start seeing them jump out of the water. Get probably you know light switch on because of the mullet run they kind of start coming back closer inshore and um feeding on this mullet is kind of what i assume uh i I agree do you think that y'all do y'all think it's because the majority of them are pushing north of us or do you think they're pushing offshore of us or what do y'all think that has to do with i don't know i don't know if it has to do with water temperature or bait i'm not really sure what do you think mike I would think probably them just following like the glass ads and a lot of that stuff farther north, but yeah, yeah I know they catch know, them off Virginia Beach and up into Maryland. Yeah, I would so. say Chesapeake Bay, all that area up there. I know they catch the Spanish really good up there, so I'm assuming as they all just that, keep going north. Yeah, and then like in the early fall, I feel like a lot of times you see the bigger Spanish when we get that first initial run of like our bigger mullet, like the big four and five inch mullet. When we start seeing them show up, is kind of when you see those bigger Spanish show up. Yeah. And then like the other day, I mean, we were sitting inside the inlet, and we caught like a 16, 17 inch Spanish, um, and they were busting, you know, big five, six inch mullet. And whenever mm-hmm. we laid him out, you know, at the dock, he had three or four of them just shoved in his stomach. So yeah. I think yeah. that's probably the biggest reason that you're seeing bigger Spanish right now is because there's, you know, better meals out there than just the little tiny glass ads that most of your 12, 13 inch Spanish are feeding on. Sure. Yeah. The so way that I you're catching those bigger ones for sure, the bigger schools of mullet for sure. The way you're catching those bigger ones is, I mean, you'll catch them dragging a Clark spoon or throwing a jig sometimes, but it's usually going to be, especially later on in the year, you know, when there's betas is around is, is on a big mullet or a, or a mint Hayden or something like that. Um, yeah. You know, the biggest ones every year are always caught by people like trolling for King mackerel and maybe they have a yeah. smaller mint Hayden on and they catch a, you know, 34 inch Spanish or something like that. But I, was gonna say, I think for a lot of people, they throw into a bait ball and they immediately start working the jig, which is fine. You're going to pick up Spanish doing that. Um, but if you can get something that's just a little bit bigger and throw it into the school and let it sink, you know, through the bait, you're going to fill all the bait hitting it. But if you can give it that five, ten seconds to get kind of down below it before you start working it, I feel like you pick up a lot bigger fish doing that, too. Yeah, it seems like the smaller ones are kind of on the outskirts of the school and the bigger ones are underneath it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good Let's transition. Oh, sorry, what were you saying? No, oh, well, I was just going to say that um, I think the other thing that kind of uh, comes into play this time of year with the mullet run is um, redfish off the beach. Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, I feel like if you, you see like, you know, the during the summer the redfish aren't necessarily like really schooled up. I mean, I think you can find schools, but they're pretty notorious for either disappearing or breaking up or what have you. Uh, but mostly you're kind of throwing top waters, blind casting, do a lot of that. And then when the mullet run happens, it seems like a lot of times those redfish will pull out of the creeks and go to, like, the main waterway. Or they'll go out to the inlets on the beach and just do kind of the same thing that the false abacore do, right? Where they'll stage up in the inlets and waiting for all this bait to get flushed out and just sitting there waiting for easy meals. So I think that's another thing um, just to kind of keep in mind as this mullet run is going on. Yeah, you think about all these mullet that get stirred up in these turbulent inlets, you know, and the breakers and whatnot, and get sucked into these little sloughs around the inlets. You can definitely, definitely uh, hit those redfish. We've got some buddies. I know Cameron and I, or no, not Cameron and I, Jeff and I went and looked for a while the other day, um, but did not have much success. Kind of, you know, the tide kind of got jacked up on it. But this is the time of year where you could, like, you know, if you get a calm afternoon, walking the beach with a topwater plug at night and just blind casting walking down the beach like you can catch redfish like that they're sitting there looking up for yep. mullet moving down the beach so it's it's a really good time of year to surf fish for redfish you know because so mm-hmm. much stuff sitting out there uh looking for it same with trout you can start to catch the trout really good in the surf this time of year 
um, and into the fall. But definitely, you know, these these trout that are out there right now, they're out there, you know, not as migratory fish, but more so as, you know, resident fish that are sitting out there because of not only is there tons of bait, but they're swimming through breaking waves that are disturbing the school and mixing them up and fish kind of getting turned around. It's just a great buffet. I kind of wonder, um, I just thought about this now, like I said, this might be totally false, but like if during the mullet run, a lot of redfish go in the ocean and they somewhat congregate while they're out there, because usually if they're in the ocean, I feel like they're kind of schooled up. Um, that if that has anything to do with once the mullet runs over and it's a little bit colder outside and those come back in, that that has to do with those schools starting to show up early winter. I bet it does. I bet it does. You know, I think the mullet run kind of ends before that time, but I still think there is a lot of bait in the surf moving south. Because not only do the mullet get out there and move south, but so do the pinfish. And so do the, you know, every, every, either south or offshore, all these smaller fish are doing that. Um, and so I think that's probably what it is, those fish sitting out there. And then once that's over, they're kind of sliding back in. Um, and, and as we all know, you get that great transition of fish in and out, in and out, in and out, you know, throughout the whole winter. But it's like, mm-hmm. God, that wintertime red speed, we'll jump off topic for a second. It's like this time of year I start getting so excited for it. But it's the, it's yeah. the thing I get so excited for that I also am so ready to be over so quickly. Like the that wintertime schooling redfish, it's just, you know, the most anxious time of year. That's what it is. They get, they get hammered. They get hammered on. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to start putting, uh, investing in force fields and lasers and stuff like that. to kind of keep spots <laughs> on lock. Motors Thank just get you. broke down when they run past a certain point in the marsh. <laughs> uh. Oh man. The quad, the, the, just the awkward silence. Let's just live in it for a second. <laughs> um, what are some of the other fish do you think that are, you know, that really take advantage of this mullet run that we have here in North Carolina? I feel like a big one that you see is flounder. I mean, most of the time by this time of year, the the flounder is starting to really cut off in the creeks, but people are still catching them out off the beach, you know, in the surf, around the inlets. Like, that's, I feel like when you start getting those first cool waves um, where the temperature drops, you know, the flounder really respond to that a lot more than, say, redfish and other stuff where I feel like they it's kind of like a mass exodus. It's like you just go from catching flounder to you kind of don't almost, you know, in like a couple week period, it seems like, at least for me. So. Yeah, especially a lot of the bigger ones are kind of getting the inlets and going and sitting out in the ocean. Yeah. Um, I'd say you're still going to be able to pick up, you know, some small flounder, 14, 15 inches or smaller, but yeah, the 18, 20 inch that you kind of not catch consistently, but you get a couple a day or whatever during the summer, that's, they're gone. Yeah. They yeah. kind of follow those mullet on out to, the, to <laughs> the ocean. I think that's what can be so dangerous about netting this time of year for them is, you know, they're just in these essentially big schools moving out. They're really easy to target. Um, and one thing that I'm nervous about too, man, is like, and I'm not against, you know, I don't think netting is, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to get into a political netting conversation. We've had those on this podcast before. I'm just, what I'm saying is it sucks that the net pressure is so heavy on the trout now because, uh, you know, we can't take flounder. We can't take redfish. Not that I want the net pressure to be on those either, but it's like, that's what it felt like happened last year. It was like the trout fishing got pretty good and then it, they just kind of all got netted out um, and, and we couldn't really catch them anymore. But um hopefully that doesn't happen hopefully you know we get a good push of fish we definitely had less fish this past year than the year before but we also netted and hook and line killed a lot of trout the year before so yeah Yeah. it was uh it was i mean we absolutely just crushed them so yeah man i'm just i would urge anybody because i think the net boats obviously are not great for our populations of especially in the smaller bodies of water like we have on the southern part of the state yeah for sure um and i swear like and correct me if i'm wrong but i swear i've seen net boats from out of state yeah like yeah you'll South see carolina net boats they can't net there right so they come up here yeah that'll happen is that 
Okay, yeah. I, I, I could have sworn I saw a South Carolina net bet last year. But I would just urge anybody that's trout fishing a bunch this year, like, it's totally fine to keep trout. But <coughs> what I tell everybody is just don't keep fish that you're going to end up throwing in your freezer yeah. for six months. Like, there's just no point. You keep what you're going to catch, like, that day. And, I, and then if people are the from, ones, I would throw it back. And if people aren't from the coast and you want to keep an extra fish or two, go for it. But freezing trout and freezing redfish and flounder. I mean, flounder freezes okay, but and redfish does. But trout especially does not. It does not freeze well. And and the other thing you've heard us talk about on this podcast, too, is the release over 20, which there's going to be a huge push and campaign for that this fall through release over 20 um, in South Carolina. And I, I kind of want North Carolina to echo that, too, because we share fish for sure. And in South Carolina, yeah. their trout fishing is not as strong as us. Their fish aren't as big as ours. Um, and so, you know, us us kind of exemplifying, how, you know, how to manage a, a resource that has a lot of big fish in it, uh, you know, will hopefully help them out as well. But releasing a trout that's over 20 inches, like, I, I think that that is a mindset that we can apply to all our fish. You know, we have a slot for redfish, but I think even during the flounder season, it's like, let the big fish go. Release those fish over 20 mm-hmm. inches. Keep them from 15 to 20 and... Um, let them go yeah. and 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 same with the trout like throw those trout over 20 inches um do, do y'all want to take a hack at why it's important to y'all know why it's important to release fish over 20 inches is only i want to take it because i feel like i'm just talking about well it. i mean uh well first of all correction to what i said earlier i said i think i said keep what you catch <laughs> keep what if you catch it eat. keep it all <laughs> yeah keep what you're gonna eat that night um but, I, I mean, Judd, I think you're the, probably the most educated in all this. Maybe, Mike, you are too. I'm not sure. But um, I think probably y- I think y'all the, too are. The trout <laughs> over 20 inches lay like 10 times more eggs than the ones that are under 20 inches. And for that reason, you know, you could – killing a, a trout that's over 20 inches could, you know, have a serious impact on the amount of trout we have the next year. Yeah. I was gonna say every, I don't know what exactly their breeding size starts, but say 15, 16 inches. If you look at a chart of how many eggs like they create, you know, 15, and then it goes up a little bit for 16. Then by like you know the time they turn 17, 18, 19, 20, I mean it's almost straight up. How many like over just you know two or three inches they can double the amount of egg production that they make. Yeah. When they jump from that like 17, 18 inch size class up to 20 or you know more. So, yeah, you know what's it's important. It's an important thing to keep in mind for sure. You know what's a frustrating thing that that I realized during our flounder season and had this conversation with a client on the boat the other day. Um, a client that's from the Southport area and fishes a bunch and knows probably more than I do, way more than I do about flounder. Um, he was talking about, and I noticed as well, all those flounder that that I was cutting open during flounder season had were full of eggs. You know, because that flounder yeah. season is like right in their pre-spawn season so these fish are just loaded down with eggs so all these these bigger fish and not even you know this a lot of the smaller flounder breeding too um it is it just seems like bad timing i don't know let me know what y'all think in the comments if if what y'all's thought on the timing of flounder season was because you know that's still a topic that is brought up with me a lot on the boat with clients and um, and whatnot but same with trout it's like you know when do tr- trout spawn in the spring right because um, usually when I'm cutting trout open, spring is when I see eggs in them. Yeah. I think sea trout are a little bit more um, water temperature dependent. So, Mike, you get, you should know this, marine biologist. You need to know. I know. <laughs> I'm kind of... Are you looking it up right now or are you texting? <laughs> He's texting your wife. I am looking it up. All right, it says all males are mature at 12 inches and females at 15. So I got that part right. Okay. Spotting in North Carolina occurs from April to October. And this is from Department of Environmental Quality, so Division of Marine Fisheries, with peak spawn around May. So um, you're right, Jed. I was gonna say I I believe they spawn more. That's what I was thinking in the warmer months, but um, so. Yeah, but I don't know, know what they're. I don't want to say like ovulation time, but I don't know what their 
menstruation time, cycle. Like, yeah, like <laughs> when it takes, how long it takes for an egg to develop to be ready to be fertilized and like that whole thing. So, do fish have a special time of the month? No. <laughs> That is not anything to have to worry about. When a, when a small lady trout becomes a real lady <laughs> trout. <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing. That's too far. Um, no, I mean, I know like this year, like even just a few months ago, like I was in the cast net and I kept seeing flashes and I'm like, what is that? Because it wasn't mullet. They weren't coming up to the surface. So I threw the cast net over it and I mean, I call it, I don't know. 50 little three four five inch baby speckled trout and it's awesome oh, wow, I haven't that's awesome seen any, you know that's that cool. tiny in our waterways um and they were you know this was down fort fisher zeke's island area down in there and you know to see that our estuary is being you know as healthy as doing what it's supposed to allowing those baby fish you know to come in and live and grow and get bigger like that's what we want to see you know you don't see a ton of those little tiny flounder um you can catch a few here and there probably every year in a cast net but you know you just don't see tons and tons of them um yeah so yeah that was really cool because i've never seen any baby trout like that before so i think i've seen i think i've seen one that i caught the smallest one i caught ever was on the sabiki this spring Mm -hmm. trying to catch spots and whatnot for bait um that was a little tiny guy and every time i catch like if i had just a couple years ago Put, started a saltwater aquarium it would be pretty sick by now because i always talk about it and i've got had some really cool little tiny saltwater fish that i've caught over the years um but 100 percent put like an octopus in there and it would eat everything in there if we ever have a office space for eastern current which hopefully eventually we will um we'll have a saltwater aquarium for fish that we catch <laughs> we're going to we're not going to make any money because our aquarium is going to be so expensive <laughs> But uh, it'll be uh, it'll be pretty sweet. People are gonna stop by like, is this an aquarium store? We're like, no, this is not an aquarium <laughs> store. We don't really know what we are. We're Eastern Current. You can get out of here, please. Uh, we talk about boat cleaning products. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we shout out tons of products that don't give us any money for it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But yeah, it's, I mean, when when do you, when does the mullet run really run roll to? Would you would you, like end of October kind of? I feel like the mullet run really runs till probably the end of October. And I think Cameron was bringing this up is, you know, the mullet run all depends on temperature. You know, it's a little different every single year. Whether it's, you know, starts at the end of September, runs all the way to the end of October, or if it holds out a little bit. So, continue up with that one, Cameron. No, I think you're totally right. I think it, uh, I think it just varies, like depending on temperature. Um, I mean, I think that's all we can say. I don't, it could be like it could be like early October it ends, or it could be end of October it ends. It just it's so wild depending on the what year it is and how the temperature is. Yeah, it's like fish yeah. habits vary on 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 one very fixed thing. And that is like moon cycle, and then the other yeah. one is is temperature, water temperature. It, it that mm-hmm. that drives everything. I think even more so than, than the moon cycle, um, you know. And that, I think they work in unison, but um, just as depends on what we're gonna have. But he, another thing that that excites me about duck hunting as well as uh, fishing is the have you looked at the farmer's almanac about this winter? No. That we're going to have a very cold winter, like a very, very cold winter. So it's good to the point of here's where here's how I'm looking at it. It's like, okay, maybe we'll get a bunch of those Chesapeake trout down here and out of the Pamlico and like down here. But hopefully we don't have a trout kill because we've been like four mm-hmm. or five years without a big trout kill. You know, at least not yeah. humans have been killing them pretty good, but the weather has not. Um, mm-hmm. And then, but it also worries me because I'm like, oh crap, you know, like it's going to push a lot of ducks down here. But then a lot of times with our sea ducks, it like pushes them past us uh, if it gets too cold. Yeah. So, um, riding the line is what it's all about. <laughs> riding the line. <laughs> That's an inside uh, joke. Yeah. I, I swore I hated inside jokes on podcasts, and there I go. The same <laughs> one. Um, but yeah. think too, like if you look at 
weather occurrences and like hurricanes, tropical storms, the amount of fresh water, you know, how much rain we get, a lot of that stuff plays into a lot of it too. I mean, like our Definitely. fish right now, as soon as we got a cold snap, we got 10 inches of rain here in Wilmington two weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, not only was it cold to help try to start pushing those mullet out, but that much fresh water dumping in, at least on the mainland side creek to the waterway, you know, a lot of that, even though we're getting a huge tide cycle, you're dumping six, eight inches of rain in a couple of days. Their the salinity drops a lot. It mm-hmm. dirties up the water, brings a lot of pollutants and that kind of stuff in from the land areas around them. You know, that drives a lot of those mullet and a lot of those fish out of those areas For and sure. pushes them to somewhere different in the marsh. Um, you know, me and Judd, we fished back in college and what was that, Hurricane Sandy or something? I don't even remember. I don't want Sandy, but... Some tropical storm come through at the end of September. I think it was, it was Sandy. Like, it was Sandy. Was it? it was I Sandy. can't remember now. Yeah. But we, you know, we had been fishing and like everybody's like, oh, the trout are here, you know, trout are here. And we just, we couldn't find them. And it was like, as soon as that storm rolled around and as soon as it passed, it was like two days after we went fishing. We're like, let's just go see what happens. And it had dropped the temperature and changed the water just enough that the trout were there. I mean, they were everywhere that you could find them but it was like for a week and then temperatures kind of rose back up water quality changed back to what it was right before the storm and they're gone you know not gone gone but they were not here like they were and they were eating so hard too because i think that was like during the mullet run when that that hurricane came through and it just Mm -hmm. flushed everything out and so there was no food like there was food but the mullet that all these trout were uh, or maybe it was like, a little bit I later. I don't care what comes past my face. I'm going to eat it. Yeah. And that was in a place that is not a secret. But for some reason, me and Mike had it a secret for two days. It was, <laughs> I mean, it was stupid, stupid. Every fish, 18 to 20 inches. And um, that, was a, Probably that was some good fish. 50 fish. As long as you hit the tide cycle right, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was nuts. On white trash. I feel too. like, uh, I <laughs> yeah. feel like. <laughs> <laughs> that's another inside joke. <laughs> well, white trash is just like what we call a this. white soft plastic that's still been all chewed up. There's no tail on it. And they're still eating it. So, <laughs> white trash. Because it doesn't happen very often. Um, yeah. I feel like all of this kind of points to that this time of year can be uh, pretty damn tricky to figure out. Yeah. You're figuring uh, out each day. Figuring out each day. Yeah. I mean, the trout can be biting for like three days and then they're gone uh, there could be a school of redfish somewhere for three days and then they're gone <laughs> just because there's so much variance in temperature and the amount of rainfall and where the bait is it's super hard to pattern like anything just because it's constantly changing um so i mean i'm sure there's people out there that are frustrated this time of year me included I, you're definitely like not alone <laughs> as far as finding fish consistently this time of year. The biggest tip for this time of year, though, is like when you've got a bunch of bait leaving and going south, and these fish, you know, if a fish wants to take the most advantage of like the the most opportune time to feed, I mean, all that bait's got to leave inlets. And so every inlet up and down the North Carolina coast is stacked with flounder, redfish, and trout right now because... And I'm not saying you're going to go in there and catch a fish every cast, but they're, you might have to look for the zones where they're feeding and, and pay attention to what the mullet are doing and the banks that they're hitting and uh, what tide the mullet are swinging on what bank. But, but those fish are using those areas, whether it be right out right out on the beach near the inlet or up at the front of the inlet by the intercoastal waterway, uh, those fish are using that as a choke point for all that bait. So Definitely. Yeah, I know. I got it right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> The all-knowing Not at all. Not at all. I just literally repeated exactly what y'all two just said in a different way. But I got really serious about it. Yeah. Take like notes, it. guys. Take notes. <laughs> I'm just teasing. That is my new thing. I've said I'm just teasing like five times like I'm talking to my son. I'm just teasing, bud. Um, if, all else, if all else fails, just go fish for sheepset. Yeah, you had a pretty good day sheepset fish the other day, right? I did. You think yeah. that had to do with the mullet run? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I think it had nothing to do with the mullet run. Talk, t- uh, tell me about your sheepset I mean, fishing. 
I mean, it, it, we went through probably a hundred crabs in an hour. Ooh. Um, probably, probably hooked. And those weren't fiddlers, were they? No, they were mud crabs. Hundred muds. Wow. Um, probably hooked ten sheep's head and got um, three to the boat. We didn't have a great ratio <laughs> in getting them to the boat. We broke a lot off on the pilings, and you know how it is fishing around structure. Um, but it was really good, to my surprise. I, this is really probably the latest I've ever fished for sheep's head. Um, but pleasantly surprised, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Were you? What kind of jig were you fishing on, of the crabs on? I had the. I was using the four three two. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, jig that I think it's called the Jawbreaker. I got one it was right awesome. here. Let's see. Here we it, go. His, um, I think I've given him a shout out before, but his um, his Jawbreaker is really cool because he he paints him in the same color as like growth on the side of pilings whether it be like look like a fiddler crab or whether it's all black or what have you um he's got some really cool colors that uh kind of blend in yeah there you go this is uh, a big one this would be like a like a 50 or heavy current fishing the river yeah. on a rock pile or something but yeah look at those colors i mean those it looks awesome. just like a crab i think bright colors are good too you know i think a fish sees a bright color swims into it mm-hmm. You know, like, a, you know, you see a lot of these bottom jigs like this that are an orange or a green just to catch attention on the bottom. Um, but if if you're kind of trying to cover more water, maybe that could be effective. But I think when that fish gets up there and it's game time, like, this is definitely a, a better color option for sure. Yeah, How- it, 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 took, it took us a little while to have them start feeding. But it, y'all know how it is. Like, once you catch one on one piling, it's like – they all just kind of like that scent gets out in the water yeah. of like a dead crab or something. And they all just start like kind of congregating around a couple pilings and it's just one after the other. Yeah, for sure. Man, I didn't sheep's head fish at all this year, but I did sheep's head fish a bunch actually this spring in the ocean, which is fun. I do like sheep's head fishing in the ocean. Oh man. Um, I can't wait to see that. I know. But we, we didn't get the update on your boat. We talked about it last time. I'm still waiting. Man. And it's been a week. It's been a whole week. It's well, yeah, it's been a week, but there's no update. Oh, the update, man. the update that I got was that the ship, <laughs> the ship with the, my motor on it, is sitting in a port somewhere across the world <laughs> and isn't allowed to leave. <laughs> oh man, let's go get it. Let's do a vlog series. Hey man, I'm in. You want to go get it? <laughs> let's let's pirate the boat and bring the ship back. You think we could? You think we could take the Pathfinder all the way to uh, China? No, I don't. <laughs> I think the boat could do it, but I just can't leave my family for that long. Um, man, talk about days too that like the past couple days in the ocean fishing for albies. It's been so much rougher than like I'm looking at all my weather stuff beforehand and like gonna run out there and it's just I don't know. It's yeah. just it, I have not been reading it well. I'm like, God, I'm dropping the ball. Let's say Saturday, well, like Monday of last week, gorgeous. Ran my flat skiff like, I don't know, six, seven miles in open ocean. Didn't see a fish one. And then it was like Tuesday, wanted to try again, and garbage. Not even a chance that I was getting out there. Yeah, it's and then, back and forth. You know, like, yeah, and then like by Saturday, or Friday morning, it was still awful. But by Friday afternoon, I mean, it wasn't doable out there, but it was doable enough i got to the end of the inlet and that's when got that king you know like but just it, enough out there here's a question that might um if we're going to end with albies for mike and judd your best albie day has it been on a dead calm day or a day that's fairly rough it's a little chunky a little chunky there. yeah um, I think, yeah, me too. They eat better. I think and there's something to that. Yeah. Yeah. I did have I one day, eat. though, last year that was really calm, that was really freaking good for a while. But I would say chunkiness. I was going to say, I, I mean, I think as far as, like, fish coming up, like, Saturday was a nice day, and I saw a lot of fish. They just don't stay up very long. Like, mm-hmm. they're up, and by the time you see them, 
get everybody ready to like make a move to them, they're they're down again if you're not on top of it. Like I told my guys then, it was like you know it's combat fishing almost at that point. Oh yeah, when it's mm-hmm. that calm out there. But when they're you know that little texture chunkiness, whatever you want to call it, I don't feel like they're as spooked by the boat noise because there's so much going on. I think the bait's a little bit more disturbed once they get push them up to the surface so they can feed on them a little longer. You know, yeah. I think there's just a little bit more too much going on for them to be too terribly focused on like spooking up the boat and that kind of stuff too. For sure. Yeah, I'm kind of torn, man, because I feel like early season Albies, I have my better days when it's rough. Yeah. But then from what I can remember, I bet my like best Albie days ever have been when they're here really thick, like there's no question you're going to go out there and you're going to see some have been on like really calm days yeah yeah it's like it's a it's a line you gotta ride the line between bait and (laughs) and uh and and what the wind's doing but it it seems i don't know man they definitely eat really good when it's a little choppy and they don't spook from the boat as much but then you get those days where it's like slick calm and they're eating everything and they're not spooking from the boat I just there's one day last year that I just remember where I was like I just remember telling my clients like keep casting just keep catching them like you're never gonna see it like this again just keep catching them <laughs> we were I, I, all I was doing was like the tide was falling out of this one inlet and I would just kept kind of like you know bumping us back up kind of close to the inlet but they were just like everywhere it wasn't like a yeah. it wasn't like a pod it was just like a one massive pod of Mm-hmm. fish spread out like every three feet there was a fish on the surface for like an hour and a half and so you'd throw the jig and get like two cranks in and you'd be, you'd be eaten yeah 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 and luckily I had the kind of people that were like yeah let's just see how they were like 29 30 30 like catching them and <laughs> instead of like being like alright we're over this because I was like we, we gotta just keep catching them this is as good as it gets um, a lot of times like for me running a skiff more than like a bigger bay boat or something you know, I can only get out when it's a nicer day, but yeah. I think just having that smaller boat, that smaller profile, less noise, like, I feel like my fishing, like you said, once they're kind of here, even if it is a nice day, like, you can slide in a lot closer to them, you can get on them a little easier, a lot of those days, you know, you can drop your trolling motor and just sit outside the inlet, once you start seeing them and they're here pretty regularly, you know, you can drop trolling motor and just kind of sit there and yeah. be able to fish for them a lot more consistently. See, yeah. that's not a method I've ever played with, the chill motor. Like, I never, ever use the chill motor. Just because if I need to make a quick move, it's like I, I've got the chill motor down, but I don't know. I think well, one thing that I, I used to do <coughs> that I've stopped doing is when I first started be fishing, I'd be like, like a freaking madman. I'd see a school pup over there, and I was like, running over to him as fast as possible. And, like, you know, I had success. What's wrong with that? Near as much as I, what'd you say? What's wrong with that? What? <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> I'm just well, kidding. That, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's, there's nothing wrong with, like, r- running to them, but um, there is something wrong with, like, running right up on them. Right, right. And, and especially if there's other boats out and someone else is fishing them or what have you. But, like, I've had way more success if I see them um, bussing. And if it's windy at all, I'll go around them, go upwind or up current of them, and kind of just let my boat drift into them from, like, 50, 80 yards away. And that way they just stay up for so much longer and you get multiple shots on them instead of Definitely. you run right up on them and they're just like, whoop, down. Um, so that's just one thing I'd keep in mind. It's just like you don't have to run straight to them while they're busting because you're scared that they're going to go down or you're going to miss them because most of the time they're going to stay up for a while as long as they're not spooked by anything. Yeah. It's just Agreed. like my my two cents. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I definitely agree with you. That's that's the truth. But I've I've been on like schools albies before where they're like up super good. And you know it gets when when the albies are here really thick. There's boats everywhere, and you're like fishing a big school of them, and getting a bunch of good shots. And then lo and behold, here comes Judd. Larry and his brother. <laughs> 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 just like 
screaming up the beach to come get on the same school because they saw him bussing from half a mile away. And uh, they run right up on them, and Put them all down. of a sudden they're gone. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm that yeah. guy sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, well, we've all been that guy. I, my judgment of like the of how far away I am, you know, is pretty bad. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it yeah it, it it definitely man even see I saw that today so much like the times and and sometimes you got to read your fish and the day like sometimes you got to be a little more aggressive and be a little tighter other days it pays off way more and more times than not it pays off way more to kind of ease into them like like Cameron's talking about so I like it yeah. um they were eating your fly pretty good today Cameron nice what are you gonna name that fly I don't think that's really my I can't claim that fly. Well, if you do, I mean, it's it. really it a be surf candy white, white combined with. It's a surf candy combined with kind of what you showed me. <laughs> we'll call it white lightning. I think it's a perfect name. White for lightning. It. Yeah, okay, I, like uh, I like that. Or riding the line. Or line rider. <laughs> oh, line rider. That's a good one. <laughs> um, I like that one. So I want to finish the podcast tonight with whoever thinks they've got a good story. Just a, a funny, funny thing that's happened on the water. The first funny thing that's happened on the water that comes to your head. Mm. Mm. I have one. Loves your job. Do I? I have one. I have one. Who 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 wants to go? Do oh, we Mike's got oh, we can Mike's do both. Go. Let's just y'all both go. Y'all both go. I don't know how funny mine is, but I had a. I took a guy. <laughs> You're already laughing. It's probably like, pretty good. Like two weeks ago. And, you know, a pulling skiff is fairly tippy, right? Um, oh, they're not gosh. like the most. The story. They're most, not good. the most balanced boats. And as soon as he, him and his friend came, and as soon as he steps on the boat, he's like, man, has anyone ever fallen off this thing? And I was like, <laughs> I was like just me. I, I'm the only one that's fallen off the boat so far, just off the pulling platform. You want like my pole slips or whatever. He's like, all right. And uh, he ended up falling off the boat twice that day. <laughs> Straight up, all the way in the water. Both yeah. times happened because he got his line caught on um, the trolling motor one time and he was reaching down to try and untangle it. Literally toppled forward, did a front somersault <laughs> off the boat. <laughs> and then the second time, <laughs> the second time, it was high tide. And I was using my trolling motor again, and he had kept casting like behind the boat and just letting it drag on the bottom. <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, you can do that." And uh, he got it tangled up in the in the polling um, in the pole, and he went to get. He like walked past me while I was on the platform standing up there to untangle it. And I was like, "No, nah, man, I got it. Don't worry about it." He's like, "Oh no, I got it." Reached down to get it, did another front somersault off the side of it. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, you're lucky it's not like 40 degrees outside. Or you, it's oh, really not. Goodness. That's awesome. <laughs> that is good. Uh, All right, Mike, what's the story about me? Let's hear it. Oh, uh, that involves you know me. The story. Um, is it so a pooping me and John story? Another buddy of ours decided to go catch some very large fish one night. And so we go look for some bait. We're out. I don't know, maybe 45 minutes before sunset, we get all set up, we got baits out, we started seeing some mullet moving around, so me, being me, I'm tired of sitting there watching bait soak, so grab a little little tiny top water. Oh, like, this, oh, story, okay. this isn't a funny fish. story, this is just a badass story. <laughs> this is a funny one for me. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we're sitting there, you know, twitching top waters. And all of a sudden, this thing just goes missing. Never saw a fish eat it, nothing. It just goes missing. So, hook up, rods doubled over, come about, I don't know, 15 seconds after I come tight, tarpon skies up out of the water. We fought it for, I don't know, what, 45 minutes that night? I think on so. Like a little 3,000. Tiny, tiny, Get tiny it. little trout rod. Yeah. Get it right up beside the boat, and I'm looking at Judd. Um, he's driving, you know, keeping me on top of it and everything. Um, I'm like, he's either coming up now or we're breaking him off. Like, there's just no other option, I don't think, at this point. So I pull up 
He launches into the boat, smacks me in the chest, puts the treble hook through me. Judd comes up to the front to help and catches Judd right between the legs. Judd's <laughs> down on the bottom of the boat. I have treble hooks hanging out of my chest. <laughs> Typer comes into the I guess boat, it is pretty funny. <laughs> ben, the other guy that was with us. I mean, he's not he's not a small guy, but he's not huge by any means, so he's like trying to hold him, keep him from beating himself to death and like I mean it was just total It's a very complete, green fish going yeah, nuts. Yeah, very in the green bed. fish. Just total chaos for like fifteen, twenty minutes for that tarpon in the boat. But I think every single one of us in that like five, first five minutes of the having that fish, we all were injured with something. Oh, for sure. For sure. And we actually got... It wasn't in the boat for 20 minutes. I'm going to say that because... No, no, no. He was in the boat for maybe... He jumped into the boat himself, so he did it to himself. Yeah. But he was in the boat for, I would say, two minutes. We we got the fish, got a picture since he was already in the boat, and released him. And the fish did swim off. Unfortunately, you know, I think it's a 50% chance if it lived or not, but he swam off strong. Um, yeah. But not without injuring all of us a little bit before. <laughs> yeah. So, hey man, that's uh, the price you pay. That's the price you pay. But it was it was a fun time. I won't say that it was the funniest, but the you gotta the love the Florida Everglades. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Job I said you gotta love the Florida Everglades. <laughs> uh, that was a good, oh, man. good time. <laughs> I've, I still, uh, on a cool night, I can still feel a little twitch down there where that fish hit me. <laughs> uh, when a storm's rolling in. When a storm's rolling in. Yeah. I hear that. Your, your face, though, that night was priceless. Yeah. That was, <laughs> it was, uh, that was pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome. That was an old, like, it's like a $2 badonkadonk topwater, too. It was like a crappy, yeah. crappy topwater. The thing got slurped quick, though. Um, well, sweet. That's a good story. I will off to share a funny story next time. Um, guys, thank you all so much for checking out Eastern Current. We love you all. We love the support. Um, and we would not do this podcast without our faithful listeners. So um, give us something. Shoot, shoot over some topics in the comments, uh, what you all want to hear. Um, on the YouTube video, just comment on it and, and let us know what y'all want us to you know talk about in some of these upcoming episodes. Um, also, I think we're going to try to do a fall topwater episode coming up soon. Um, everybody loves topwater. We try to do a little topwater you know, with the seasons talk. So um, everybody let me know in the comments your favorite topwater as well because I want to I kind of pull together some that we can talk about and kind of share with everybody. So um, we'll get ready for, for the next episode or, or an episode or two down the road with that. So um, anything you want to leave it, leave everybody with you guys or y'all y'all ready to check out? I'm spent, man. I'm spent I too. Nothing. I think it's pretty funny that the three dads made it on the podcast tonight, and the the single young buck, not single, but he's not married. Young buck is uh, couldn't make it on the podcast. Life's too busy. Oh, Jeff, he'll never hear this. He already knows everything about fishing, so he's not gonna listen to the podcast. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, Well, cool, guys. Thanks for checking it out. We'll talk to you all next week. Later.